In our previous video, we brought to your view how Ogoja, the Midwestern towns of Agbo, Sapele, Asaba, Benin, and the western town of Ore were captured during the Nigerian Civil War. Today, we will look at the biggest battles of the Nigerian Civil War, that is, how the Nigerian army fought back to reclaim the western and midwestern towns invaded in Suka, Inugu, Kalaba, and the most destructive Abagana ambush. Please stay tuned. By September 25, the Biafrans had withdrawn from Agbo in the Midwest. And by September 38, they were back in the tiny fortified perimeter around Asaba with their backs to the Niger River. The demoralized troops north of Inugu retreated despondently in front of the Nigerians approaching from Insuka, and Inugu came within shelling range by the end of the month. On the 6th of October, Biafrans in Asaba crossed the Niger River to Onicha and destroyed the freshly constructed Niger Bridge behind them. This was done to prevent the troops of the 2nd Division, commanded by Moritola Mohamed, from crossing. Two days previously, on October 4th, the Nigerians had entered Inugu. Abroad, it was generally presumed that Biafra must collapse. Colonel Odumegu Ojuku was constrained to tender his resignation, but it was unanimously rejected by the Consultative Assembly. With the Banjo and his collaborators' episode coming to an end, Biafra refocused on the tax at hand, the fighting. This was the beginning of a long and difficult journey for the Biafrans. Nigeria's massive imported firepower were becoming overwhelming at this point. Most of Nigeria's supplies were from the United Kingdom, Belgium, Holland, Italy, and Spain. The federal government also managed to increase the size of the federal army to over 40,000 men after another recruiting drive. The troops in the northern part of Biafra now formed the 1st Division. Those across the Niger River, under the command of Muhammad, formed the 2nd Division. The 1st was commanded from Makodi, miles away in the northern region, by Colonel Muhammad Shua. Most of the Nigerian army was controlled by the Hausas. And of course, please like this video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. Bisala's predecessor, Colonel J. Aru Akahan, had been killed in the controversial circumstances in a helicopter crash. The late autumn and winter was not a happy time for Biafra. In the north, Inugu fell. Further east, in the Ogoja sector, the Nigerian troops had pushed down from Ogoja to Ikom along the main road leading to the neighboring Cameroons. Then, on October 18, the newly formed 3rd Federal Marine Commando Division under the command of Colonel Benjamin Adekunle made a seaborne landing at Calabar in the southern path of Cross River. With Boni still festering and the menace of Mohammed trying to cross the Niger River, the Biafrans would now need to fight on five different fronts. Despite fierce counter-attacks, the Nigerians could not be dislodged from Calabar. With their beachhead growing steadily stronger, Adekunle burst out and forged towards the north, up the eastern bank of the Cross River, in attempt to link up with the 1st Division at Ikom. In closing the second road out of Calabar to the Cameroons, Biafra was cut off from road contact with the outside world. The single air link that now remained had been transferred to Port Harcourt. The lone B-26 at Inugo was riddled with bullets on the ground, but has now been replaced by an equally lone B-25 piloted by Fraze Hart, a former left wolf pilot. Throughout the autumn, foreign correspondents gleefully forecasted that Biafra was finished. It was a cry that had been heard several times before and has been heard many times since. The Biafrans did not worry much about it. During October and November 1967, Colonel Mohamed tried three times to cross the Niger River by boat from Asaba and capture Onicha. On the first occasion on 12 October, he got across with two battalions. One of the operational commanders at Onicha was Colonel Joe Achuzi, a tough and ruthless Midwesterner who had spent the Second World War with the British Army and had fought in Korea. He had been working as an engineer in Port Harcourt when the war started and had enlisted in the militia. 
From there, he transferred to the Biafran army. Achuzi ambushed Muhammad on his way across the Niger. As Muhammad's boot landed and his men disembarked with their armored cars, Achuzi watched them from the timber yard of the Ministry of Works as the house of soldiers set fire to the Onisha market, the largest in West Africa with a stock once valued at about 3 million pounds. After this senseless piece of destruction, they got into line and marched off through the abandoned town. They went about a mile when the Biafrans counter-attacked, losing their armored vehicles. The Nigerians were pushed back towards the river and were finally destroyed near the landing stage. Subsequently, two more attempts were made to cross the Niger by boat, but on each occasion, the craft were attacked using machine guns. The boat sank, causing heavy losses, mostly by drowning. The bulk of the losses here were taken by the Yoruba soldiers in the second division until their commander objected to further crossing. Leaving the Yoruba soldiers to keep watch at Asaba, Mohammed took his house as soldiers towards the north of the Niger. They crossed into the northern region and entered Biafra from that side, intending to take Onicha from the landward approach. From Lagos, General Gowan had predicted a finish to the war by the end of the year. But when this became impossible, he made another prediction for the crushing of Biafra by 31st of March 1968. By the year's end, the situation south and east of Inugu was stable. The Nigerian forces were about 20 miles east of the town. While to the south, the Biafrans faced the Nigerians in the extreme outskirts of the town. In the northeast of Biafra, the federal forces occupied the whole of Ogoja province and were facing the Biafrans across the Ahim River, a tributary of the Cross River. Further south, Adekunle's forces were halfway from Calabar to Ikom. Down south again, the Boni sector remained much as it has been five months before. Several attempts at a waterborne push towards the north of Boni had ended in disaster. The Nigerian firepower, particularly in artillery and mortars, was getting steadily more murderous. Nigeria had just got fresh supplies of armored cars from Britain. It was habitually these armored cars that made progress, for the Biafrans had nothing that could touch them. With Nigeria receiving an ever-increasing supply of arms, while Biafra's supplies remained roughly static, fighting became increasingly difficult. In late December, Colonel Muhammad, with his division now swollen to about 14,000 men, set up for the 68-mile march down the main road to Onisha. He took with him enormous supplies. Just outside Inugu, close to the town of Udi, the second division met the Biafrans and one of the biggest running battles of the war was on. True to Hausa tradition, Mohammed kept and moved his troops in solid phalanxes down the road. By mid-February, he had reached Oka, still 30 miles from Onicha. His losses had been enormous since his path was known and the federal soldiers did not like to move far from the main road. Throughout the war, they have been highly wary of going off into the bush where their heavy equipment cannot follow them. Keeping mass formation, they made easy target for the Biafrans. While teaching tactics at Teshi in Ghana, Ojuku had a young Lieutenant Moritola Muhammad in his class. Now, Ojuku is plotting to outwit his greatly superior adversary. The Biafrans concentrated on attacking his flanks and rear, causing high casualties. But with little regard for loss of life among his men, Muhammad pressed doggedly on. At Oka, he missed his biggest chance. The Biafran forces were terribly thin in front of Muhammad, but strong at rear and sides. If he had pushed much harder forward at Oka, he could have got straight to Onicha. Colonel Ojuku realized the danger and switched extra forces to the main Aziks. He needed 48 hours to complete the required logistics and Muhammad gave it to him. Muhammad's troops would spend three days to destroy Oka Township. By the time they had finished, the Biafrans had regrouped. Further north, Achuzi with his crack 29th battalion had been off on his own, 
marching 92 miles and taking from the rear the town of Adoru in the northern region. From there, he recaptured Insuka, also from the rear, having first vetted the defenses from inside. Disguising as an elderly farmer, Achuzi spied on the Nigerian troops in Insuka. Ten hours later and back in uniform, Achuzi and the 29th Battalion swept in on the undefended side. From Insuka, he marched south towards Inugu and linked up with Colonel Mike Ivensu at Ukehe, a town between Insuka and Inugu. This was a great achievement for the Biafrans because that road was the main supply route for the Nigerians at Inugu. But the task of stopping Muhammad was too enormous. Then, Ojuku reluctantly deployed both condels south to support the fight going on between Oka and Abagana. However, Muhammad made it to Abagana, 16 miles to Onicha, in the first week of March. The fighting got tougher with the arrival of the two extra battalions of Achuzi and Ivensu. Muhammad desperately called for more men and got another 6,000 from Inugu, stripping the town bare of its garrison. If Ojuku had a spare battalion, he could have retaken Inugu. But Muhammad pressed on to Ogidi, 8 miles from Onicha, leaving his main force at Abagana. On the 25th of March, the spearhead of the 102 and the 105th Hausa battalions, with Muhammad leading them, passed through to Onicha. Achuzi realized they could not be stopped, so he swung in behind them and followed into Onicha so closely. He hoped to rush them straight into the river. It might have worked, for the two federal battalions were exhausted. But on the road, another Biafran battalion mistook Achuzi's men for the Nigerians. There was a clash. When that had been sorted out, Achuzi pressed on. But at the Apostolic Church, he and his men came across the 300 corpses of the congregation who had been executed by the Nigerian forces. The Biafran soldiers were so stunned they refused to move on. It was their officers who had the unpleasant task of moving the bodies out of the way. When the road was clear again, Achuzi moved on, but with an 18-hour delay. He found the Nigerians well dug in already. He had two choices to make here, to try to force the Nigerians out of their position or to turn back towards Abagana. The first option would have exhausted his own men and their ammunition supplies, leaving them unable to cope with the larger force he was sure was following them down the road. An argument developed between Achuzi and the other Biafran commanders who maintained there was no larger force awaiting. Achuzi got his way and set up an enormous ambush outside Abagana. The next morning, a 102 lorry convoy with 6,000 men on board and 350 tons of equipment rolled into the ambush. This would be known as the Abagana ambush, the biggest ever ambush during the Nigerian Civil War. A chance motor bomb hit the 8,000 gallon petrol tanker and the vehicle exploded backward, shooting a thong of blazing foil 400 yards down the road and covering 60 vehicles behind, which were soon burnt out. The surviving soldiers panicked, jumped down and ran. The awaiting Biafran infantry got them. Very few got out alive. Even though Muhammad made Onicha, but out of 20,000 men he had brought, only about 2,000 entered Onicha. The rest had been lost on the way. Lagos was not pleased when Muhammad crossed the Niger in the small boat. The 102nd and the 105th in Onicha were relieved and fresh troops sent across the river from Asaba. Soon, there were 5,000 more Nigerians in Onicha and, despite repeated effort to retake the city, they remained in control of it. The garrison was boosted to 8,000 men by November 1968. East of Inugu, the Nigerians crossed a steep and narrow gorge at Ezulu and captured Abakeliki. This cut off the Biafrans east of Abakeliki from facing the Nigerians across the Anyam River, and they withdrew to a new line south of Abakeliki. Within this, the Nigerians in Ogoja province had crossed the Antim on another belly bridge and linked up with Abakelike. 
For the first time, the two wings of the first Nigerian division had made contact and possessed an east-west strip running along the north of Biafra. At the Kunle State Division had pushed up the valley of the Cross River on the eastern bank to Obubra, the last major town in Ikoe country. It was further south, however, that Adekunle got his big break. We will look at how the war progressed from here in our next video. Check this video here for our previous episode on the Biafran War. And of course, please like this video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel as well. And I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.